Welcome to Advance with MUSE Health. I'm your host, Erin Spain. This show's mission is to help you find ways to preserve and optimize your health and get the care you need to live well. Surgery is the only method that can effectively treat a groin hernia, and there are more than 1 million hernia repairs performed in the U.S. every year. But not all hernia surgeries are the same, and there are different considerations when it comes to treating men and women with this condition. Dr. Heather Evans is a professor of general and acute care surgery at MUSC Health. She's here to discuss her work and research in the area of minimally invasive general surgery, including laparoscopic hernia repair, and how it pertains to women's health. Welcome to the show, Dr. Evans. Thank you. It's so nice to be here, and I'm delighted to get to talk about this, which I think is a really important issue for women. Well, let's talk about that. When we think of hernias, we often think of men with this condition. So explain to me what are the most common types of hernias and who really is at the most risk of this condition? Well, men certainly are at higher risk for developing hernia. In fact, we believe that almost a quarter of men will require a hernia repair in their groin in their lifetime. So that's a huge number of people. In terms of women, it's much less common. However, those of us who do hernia repairs in women are suspicious that there probably are a lot of women out there that have hernias that are attributed to pelvic pain and they just haven't been diagnosed yet or they've been misdiagnosed. So one of the challenges that we have as hernia surgeons is trying to figure out who actually has one. And there are different kinds of hernias in the groin. The most common kind of hernia in the groin is called an inguinal hernia, and men are susceptible to this. There are two different kinds of inguinal hernia. One goes through the area where the testicle passes through into the scrotum as you're developing in utero as a little baby. In some people, that tract never fully closes down after the baby's born. And so they're left with this pathway that's kind of open. A lot of premature infants need to have early hernia surgery because of that. Now, I don't see those patients. I tend to see people that, for whatever reason, later in life develop a swelling or a bulge or pain in their groin. And those are the most three most common symptoms that particularly men will see when they develop a hernia. So the other kind of inguinal hernia is a is called a direct inguinal hernia. And this actually occurs a little bit closer to where the pubic bone is. There's a bit of a weakness in an area where different muscles and ligaments sort of cross over each other in the groin. Over time, you know, men who lift heavy things for us all the time, particularly people that are like landscapers and movers and people that are doing heavy labor tend to experience these. But, you know, just your average guy going to help somebody move furniture one day can find that they suddenly have a bulge in their groin that they didn't the day before. And a lot of people find these in the shower because they just notice it. So those are the two most common kinds of inguinal hernia. And then there are others. And women are more susceptible to one called a femoral hernia, which is the area where the femoral vein and artery lead down into the leg. For whatever reason, we think it's probably an anatomic factor. Women are more susceptible to that kind of hernia than men are. So those are the top three that we typically see. So how do symptoms differ with men and women? So like I mentioned, a lot of men will just notice that they have a bulge when they're in the shower. I think most people that have an inguinal hernia don't actually experience a lot of pain. There are some people that do, and you can suddenly have pain when you're lifting something and the hernia pops out for the first time. With women, the symptoms can be quite a bit more subtle. You know, we have different organs in our pelvis. We definitely have different stress on our pelvic muscular floor. So we sometimes will attribute pain that we have to other causes, you know, whether it's menstrual pain or other kinds of pelvic pain related to female reproductive organs. A lot of the pain that women have gets kind of chalked up to those things. So it is a little bit more subtle. Most women who have hernia don't present to my clinic with this new 
onset bulge, they actually are presenting more often with with pelvic pain. So, you know, this is a little bit harder to diagnose in women. And on occasion, we'll have some women come to the clinic that actually were diagnosed with hernia after they've had surgery for other reasons. So I think this is a real challenge for practitioners because I I think it's been underappreciated in women in general, particularly because women have been excluded from all the major clinical trials about hernia. Well, I want to talk about that because another issue with women is that women with these groin hernias are more likely to develop and become emergency situations and have a greater chance of developing complications than men. Tell me about that. There's a new study that just came out this month that's a retrospective study from Sweden. They looked at 40,000 patients over five years. They have very good record keeping in Sweden, and it's a pretty homogenous population. So they're able to track patients very well over time. And what they found was that women were much more likely to present with a need for emergency surgery. And the concern about that is that when people present and they need to have an emergent operation, they're presenting with pain and they're presenting typically with a concern that they have entrapped something in the hernia. A hernia itself is a hole. It's a weakness in the inguinal floor, in the abdominal wall, wherever the hernia is actually present. And we always worry about particularly intestine getting stuck in that defect and then the bowel not being able to get enough blood flow causes it to get sick and inflamed. And then we sometimes will see very bad infections and other problems develop because of that. So that's something we like to (laughs) avoid. And so when people present with an acute onset of pain and they have imaging that supports that they have a hernia that's incarcerated, so to speak, then they have to have an emergency emergency operation. And we'd like to avoid that. You know, we'd like to do this as an elective operation, meaning that, you know, you choose the time at your convenience where you have surgery rather than in the middle of the night when you're experiencing an emergency. But the question is, how do we find people that are at risk for developing this kind of incarceration? And to be honest, the problem with women is that we simply don't know who is at risk for this because we haven't studied it. And so there's really a call to action at this point for us to look to see if we can figure out what the risk factors for incarcerated inguinal and femoral hernia in women so that we can anticipate that and help people to avoid those emergent situations in the future. What is the ideal situation as far as getting surgery and what type of surgery do you perform and which has the best outcomes? We like to say amongst hernia surgery, surgeons that the best operation that you get is the operation that that surgeon is best at. So for example, for many, many years, the only operation that was done was an open inguinal hernia repair. And that involves making an incision over the groin, dissecting through the layers of the abdominal wall, finding the defect, pushing anything that is stuck in the defect back into the abdomen, and then closing that defect and the tissue that you entered to be able to access the defect with suture. In the 70s, there was a new operation developed where mesh was used to reinforce that area. And that really became the gold standard hernia repair for open repairs. It's called the Lichtenstein repair. Pretty much all general surgeons in the United States have trained and learned how to do this operation. So it's the most common operation that's performed. And it's a very safe operation. And it's tried and true. It's pretty much the standard of care up and until the last couple of years when more minimally invasive approaches to hernia repair were developed. The first repairs that were done were done with just laparoscopy. You may have heard of people having their gallbladder or their appendix removed with laparoscopic surgery. This was a development that took a little bit more skill because we were operating in a plane that was not just inside the abdomen, but between the layers of the abdominal wall. And so there was a period of time where this operation gained some prominence, but it took people a long time to get good 
good at it. It was a difficult thing to adopt in the beginning. But I would say now most people who train in general surgery programs across the United States learn how to do that operation as well. And most recently, the biggest development has been the adoption of robot-assisted laparoscopic surgery, where we can have a platform with really outstanding, fine instrumentation that allows us to really see better, number one. We have a 3D vision with the robot platform. And then number two, the instruments that we use to do the dissection allow us to do much finer work. And, you know, we're seeing individual nerves now, whereas before we were a little hampered by the fidelity of the cameras that we were using. Now we're able to really see things incredibly well. And what this does for us is it allows us to do the most minimal dissection possible to be able to put a piece of mesh to reinforce the area of weakness and then close anything over top of that with a lot of dexterity. And I think that this has been a real development in hernia surgery, mostly for the operator, to be honest. I don't think that we have seen a tremendous change in the outcomes between laparoscopic and robot-assisted laparoscopic surgery for the patient. But for the the surgeon, I have such a degree of confidence in what I'm doing that I feel like my technique has really evolved even over the last year where I'm doing much less dissection. And my hope is that by doing that, I'm going to cause much less pain in the short term for my patients and also to decrease the incidence of chronic pain after hernia surgery, which certainly exists. Given all of this, what do you want women to know about hernias? And, you know, what should they be looking for? I know you said it's difficult to diagnose. Tell me what women can do at home. Number one, if you have asymmetry and one groin looks like it has a bulge and the other doesn't, I think that's a pretty straightforward thing that should be evaluated. Even if there is no pain, I do think that it's worthwhile having that checked out. And there are a number of things that can be done. A lot of primary care doctors are not as familiar with doing a hernia exam as surgeons are. And we have come to rely very heavily on imaging to be able to help us with that exam because sometimes it's just really hard to tell. So sometimes an ultrasound will be ordered, which is a non-invasive imaging method where a transducer, a little wand is placed over the groin by a technician and those images are recorded and evaluated to determine whether or not there's a bulge that can be seen better underneath the skin. And then if that's equivocal or if we still have some concern that we haven't seen what we need to see, we certainly can order additional imaging. And depending upon the patient's presenting symptoms, that may be a CT scan or an MRI scan. And those imaging modalities are really helpful in the way that I talk to patients when they come to my clinic or if I do a telemedicine consult. It's very important to me to share the images that I have and show the patients where we see the hernia defect because I think that's helpful in making decisions. It's also helpful in understanding that you're not crazy and that pain that you've been having or that bulge that you have actually is represented here in this imaging that we can see. And on occasion, you know, I can reassure people that they don't have a hernia, but by and large, the people that show up in my clinic have been to a lot of people, unfortunately, before they've been to me. And I think that it's important to try and really understand what's going on with you as you make a decision as to whether or not you want to have surgery. What do you enjoy about this work and what sort of satisfaction do you get from seeing a patient make a full recovery after hernia surgery? First of all, the inguinal surgery, whether it's a femoral hernia or an inguinal hernia, that's an outpatient surgery. I typically will tell my patients they'll have about three days of pain and discomfort and then they should be able to get back to their lives. And so one of the most satisfying things about that is that I have people come to me who've been suffering for a long time and they've been putting off having surgery or they've been misdiagnosed. And pretty much, you know, the next time I see them, they feel better. They actually feel like themselves again. And so that's really rewarding. So we've been talking about hernia repair quite a bit, but that is not the only thing that you do at MUSC Health. Tell me about the other surgeries that you perform. 
I also do abdominal wall reconstruction, which is also a hernia surgery, but it's very different from the groin surgery we've been talking about. We have patients that have had surgery in the past, and most abdominal surgery is done through a midline incision, although not all. And over time, those incisions that have been closed with suture can break down for whatever reason, and you can develop what's called an incisional hernia. So in extreme cases where those hernias develop and are painful or there is intestine at risk for sticking into that defect, we can perform operations to fix those hernias. And an abdominal wall reconstruction is sort of a new concept in hernia repair over the last 10 years or so, where we're trying to restore abdominal wall function. As that midline breaks down and the rectus muscles, which are the six pack in the abdomen, as they separate, you lose some of the ability to use your core. And that's a really important part in exercise, but also in posture. As the core destabilizes, people develop back pain. And that can be really debilitating. We tend to see incisional hernias in patients that have had infections in the past or who develop some weight gain after they've had surgery. And so part of deciding when and whether or not to have surgery will sometimes depend on the health of the person, their weight, and what their expectations are for restoring function. So the abdominal wall reconstruction can be anything from making an incision through the old incision site and restoring that strength and integrity to the midline by reinforcing it with mesh, or it can involve a much more extensive procedure where the different layers of the abdominal wall are kind of delaminated during the operation operation and we can release the lateral musculature on both sides of the abdomen to try and move those rectus muscles, those six-pack muscles back together and then reinforce the whole thing with a really big piece of mesh. That's the most extreme version of abdominal wall reconstruction. And we don't do that nearly as often as some of the other more limited surgeries, but I think it's a really important operation for us to have in our toolkit because there are patients that really need this to be able to restore function and get back to their lives. Is there anything that I missed or that you want to reiterate that you think is important for listeners to know? I think the most important thing is if you think you have a hernia, you actually can self-refer to our clinics. We have a hernia center at MUSC and we are available to see patients on direct referral. So you don't have to go see your primary care doctor if you think that that's something that's going on with you. I would also say that if you think you have a hernia, it's best to get it evaluated before it becomes a problem. At least you can have a discussion with a surgeon and understand what the risks and potential benefits of surgery are. I would hate for someone to listen to this podcast and feel like, well, that's not me. I don't need to be evaluated. We're happy to see anybody that suspects they might have a hernia. And if you're wrong, then you can go away feeling better. But if you do have a hernia, there are solutions. And, you know, we talked about hernia surgery. There are things that we can do before surgery to help people with pain and hopefully keeping the hernia from progressing while they're waiting for surgery. But by and large, you're absolutely right. The best treatment for these hernias is to have surgery. And we just want the public to know that we're here and available if they need us. What do you do to optimize your health and live well? I have a wonderfully supportive family, so I have to shout out to my husband and my two boys. I think having people around you that love you and support what you do is is so important, and I rely on them tremendously. Physically, I love to cycle. My mom actually got me into it when we lived in Seattle, Washington, and I actually participated in Lovelo this past year. It's a wonderful outlet. Just having an outlet and being able to get your heart rate up a couple of times a week is is really important. And I love to eat. So it's my balance. I'll eat well and I'll also exercise so that I can do that. Thank you, Dr. Heather Evans, for coming on the show and talking to us about hernia repairs and especially when it comes to women. Thank you so much. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. For more information on this podcast, check out advance.musehealth.org. 